Every species has a first contact war. But THE first contact war belongs only to Terra. The first contact war was a secret war. Silent. Unnoticed through the vast web of FTL lanes networked through trade federations, galactic confederacies and planetary governments. It was a war waged on the edge of the black, and the whispers of that war were not permitted to drift from the very edge of the void. And when this war was finished, a civilization was gone. Not driven back, not defeated, gone. Snuffed like a sputtering candle in the infinite darkness of the void. It was only then that the dwindling echoes of cannons and torpedoes were heard faintly in the outer rim. The core didn't notice. There was trade, politics, science, art, all drowned out the quiet. But the outskirts of the settled galaxies heard the stories and noticed the turbulence under the calm surface. Deep mining crews vanishing without a distress beacon. Freighters found drifting with stolen cargo. Missing trajectory reports and communication terminals rerouting comm signals because the relay station had gone dark. An insidious dead space creeping ever closer towards the core. Just stories from crew too long in the deep. Murmurs. Murmurs of the eradication of the Shrike by monsters from the edge of the black. Then was the incident at station GH-5360, the most infamous seven characters in living memory. The official reports are still classified, and probably will be for the next hundred rotations around the stars. But there have been leaks, stories, murmurs. Impossible to keep the incident quiet when every sensor array in the void space saw, well, what they saw, or think they saw. If the Myra's distilled into the barest fact, Shrike refugees from the genocide of their species fled into Adlian void space. The monsters from the edge of the black hunted them down. Wing Commander Violet Ake presented his report before the triumvirate in an emergency session. Ships of the line were deployed across the void space, arrayed to defend jump points and relay stations. Frigga secured checkpoints and cruisers provided overwatch, as thousands of troop transports mustered in close orbit to their garrisons. The Adelian Triumvirate, ready for a war against an invisible enemy. A mustering of his armies, more vast than had been seen since the Shrike Crusades. Now, finally, the Corps began to listen to the silence. It took notice of the darkness that crept from the edge of the black, the turbulence under the surface, of the pirate boardings that left valuable cargo untouched. Of the smuggling ships drifted with venting Apno, all crew missing, and the data drive scrubbed. Of the mutual defence treaty that was struck after the border skirmishes on Old Force 6, now invoked to draft about a million additional soldiers into the defence of Adlian strategic points. The Corps began their own defence preparations, unsure of to what purpose Adlia armed itself. Treaties strained nearly to the breaking point, like ripples in the water, militaries readied themselves across the galaxies. Then a Shrike civilian transport ship bumped into a mining probe, on the outer rim. Lawless, contested voice space, claimed by one syndicate and two lunar confederacies. The video feed exploded across the intergalactic networks. An unarmed, unshielded crew signer, with heat burn drive engines and spent fuel cells, scraps of expired rations, and a hole in the side that vented freed decks, punched there at close range by a mass driver. No energy weapons, too civilised. The interior of that transport was ripped apart for kinetics, and the Shrike aboard weren't just slaughtered. They were hurt. Tortured. Civilians. Females. Young. The mouths were crucified. The alien envoys arrived at the embassies. They gave the compiled reports on what the Shrike had awoken on the edge of the black. Soul free. Terror. Resumed high gravity combat species. A first contact war that had transformed their single world into an industrial hellscape. A munitions factory that supplied the ordnance to eradicate the entire civilization that dared to make contact. Reports were confirmed by a survivor. A single Shrike that fought the Terran shock troops within the bunkers of the Shrike homeworlds before they burned, and came out of GH-5360 still breathing. A Shrike that warned only to sue for peace and quarantine, to keep the existence of surviving Shrikes secret at all cost. That warned of a war of unnatural terror. Political turmoil exploded across the core. Economic instability. Military build-up on every border, FTR lanes locked down. One reopened when a full-spectrum distress call broadcast unencrypted through an outer rim relay station. A relay station that used to shuttle ships through an FTR lane into a deep space Shrike moon colony. A crippled Shrike frigate. Help, hull breach. Help, hull breach. The medical crews got there just before the Terran dreadnought dropped from hyperspace with a gravity warping crack. It was a dark ship. A ship that looked like war felt. 
The gun crews fed its gun houses with 1,500 kilogram slugs of depleted uranium, and the mass drivers built their payload for the drive engines of the rescue operation, before the sensors reported the dreadnought's existence. Then, HE rounds bore through the frigate's hull and transformed the ship to molten slag, slowly falling out of orbit towards the nearest gravity well. One of the escort cruisers managed a plasma cannon shot. It dissipated in blue ripples across the dreadnought's shields. Frosters fired, and the dreadnought turned with malevolent intent to bring his mass drivers to bear on the cruiser. Then, harpoons lashed out like a multitude of snakes, and the shock troopers boarded what was left of the rescue convoy. The Terran soldiers, augmented with hardware and wetware alike, cocooned in their armoured carapaces, tore the convoy apart in search of more shrike that didn't exist. Two score casualties, three dead then, four more later, including two medical personnel. Six ships that couldn't make it back through the FTL relay station. The Dreadnought, that didn't need a relay station, but vanished into hyperspace. The catastrophic revelation that a theoretical problem had been solved inside a mass panic. A species that could jump. Terran ships did not depend upon FTL jump points or relay stations. They jumped from anywhere to anywhere. Terran ships could jump. Every strategic position among the stars was rendered invalid. FTL lane fortifications, orbital turret emplacements, battleship dry docks, munitions depots, all superfluous against an enemy that could jump. The entirety of modern ship-to-ship -ship and ship-to-surface combat doctrine meaningless. Mass panic. Understatement. Mass hysteria. It was only then that the galaxies truly began to understand what the Shrike had awoken, because they were finally listening to the whispers. The Terran hunters were sleepless, unerring in their mission, brutal under their execution, consumed with a single purpose. Bribery, extortion, torture, assassination, anything to kill just one more Shrike. Those that fled the genocide in derelict freighters or paid off smugglers to run checkpoints were tracked through the stars with the same dedication as to strike gunships under mass acceleration towards unexplored systems. Jump after jump after jump, and at the end of every jump, more dead shrike. A Terran was recovered from within the scorched ruin of a far orbit refueling station. The course was lacerated and burned, dragged out from under a collapsed deck and almost 400 kilograms of a shrike warrior with more kinetic rounds in his frame than ounces of blood. The warrior was missing his horns, the Terran was missing a leg, the limb replaced with a synthetic nearly as sophisticated as a real thing. Under its armored exoskeleton it was small, compact, durable, predator's eyes but no natural weapons. No, the weapons were carried or worn. A strange amalgamation of cannibalized shrike tech and unsophisticated Terran construction. A species not evolved for war, but a species that had chosen it. The corpse was shipped to the core under military escort and dissected. Those times were choked with the terror of uncertainty. Most of the core political powers followed traditional policy and declared it a private war, refusing to drag their republics or democracies into a conflict over a newly discovered civilization a dozen systems farther out than the closest FTO lane. Even though the conflict existed wherever the dregs of the Shrike civilization fled, various corpo baronies and industrial coalitions made a killing selling weapons and ships to anything from individual citizens to private armies. Ancestral allies of the Shrike renewed their military contracts and called up reserves to active duty or well, the many enemies of the species took more lenient views on the Terran objectives. Historians will argue about the true start of the war for the next hundred revolutions. The Massacre of Kyle, Desreti Storm, the Papaya Punch, it doesn't matter. The Hunters were the arms of terror, and terror's reach was long indeed, skeletal fingers scrambling for the stars for any creature that had escaped the First Contact War. The Second Contact War began. Some just called it the Second. Most species are either wiped out when they are introduced to the FTL lanes, or are smart enough to assimilate without undue trouble, considering the usual tech discrepancy. Second contact wars are very few, but most everyone just calls it the war. The war was a war of unnatural terror. It was a war fought entirely on terrorist terms. Jump, and a Terran dreadnought dropped from hyperspace with the same otherworldly crack that announced the warping of reality. Jump and the wreckage and ruin of a fleeing Shrike racing yacht, or a military fueling station, or a cartel gunship, or a drifting slag and cerulean flares of burning Atmo. Jump. Nothing but dead space where the drone ought to have been. Jump. Torpedoes burning half for an unsuspecting troop transport. Jump. Federation factory obliterated by orbital bombardment. Jump. 1500 kilogram depleted uranium slug accelerated through the hull of a battleship. Jump. Torpedo. Jump. Slug. Jump. HE round. Jump. 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 Logistics wins wars. It's been that way since the beginning. 
Military doctrine states that at the onset of any conflict, the first priority is to secure the FTR lanes in order to establish operating bases. Useless. All useless. There are no battle lines against the species that can jump. No defensible positions. The war was everywhere and nowhere. The war was wherever Terra deigned it to be. Core. The Federation, Outer Rims, the Baroness. The Battlefront was the entirety of the Void. Connecticut's are old tech in the core. They're dirty, unsophisticated weapons. Rank with failure points. Expensive to supply and inaccurate through ammo on a surface. Every species follows a similar tech tree along its evolutionary cycle. Eventually phasing out frame rocks. Even advanced methods are doing so. For energy weapons. Fuel cells last far longer than the kinetic rounds and even the largest armory, and they suffer none of the drawbacks of chemical propellants. Arms and armor have a steep cost when it comes to logistics. A cost Terra did not have to pay, because resupply was never more than a jump away. And kinetics ignore shields, punching through unarmored hulls designed for reduced mass. Designed to reduce fuel cell expenditure during acceleration and deceleration, launch and dock. The cost of a line on FTR lanes to travel the stars. There were still some who sued for peace. Some who wished to halt the madness between species that had no quarrel beyond that which is birthed of fear, confusion, and lack of communication. But the terror of those times cannot be conveyed through mere words. The war would be fought to the bitter end. Terror dictated the terms of engagement, which made the first principle of terror military doctrine this, to enter into any and all conflict with absolute combat superiority. The usual game of strategy did not exist, a military convoy passing through the space between FTO lanes would be ambushed not by a pair of cruisers or a fighter squadron with a frigate escort, but by the combined firepower of an entire Terran wing command dropped out of hyperspace at close range. Terran carriers would skip past orbital defences, downshifting to release their payloads of heavy bombers into the stratosphere to turn the sky over planetary dry docks dark with saturation bombing. Armies deployed against Terran navies were baited into a cat and mouse game, jump after jump, taunting just out of range until frustration and impatience got the better of inexperienced recruits, and they strayed too far from the safety of the fold. Where the walls circled, invisibly, hidden behind layer after layer of hyperspace, waiting for the slaughter. The consolidated might of the core was worthless. Absolute combat superiority. The only conclusion under which Terran ships of the line would fight. The United Federation Navy was formed in response to the cataclysmic threat that now faced the galaxies. Drafts are reinstated and accelerated training programs funneled billions of soldiers into the conflict. Global economies revolutionised into planetary war machines. There was but one option. The fight must be taken to terror. It was taken to terror on the backs of 10 billion soldiers. Under the power of a million drive engines. Through the guidance of a thousand commuter simulations that calculated the formations of staggered combat boxes. Designed to maximise plasma cannon effectiveness in every direction of three dimensional space. After a thousand drills to prevent any deviation from the formations that were the only chance of safety when the perilous voyage was made to the edge of the black. The unification of a hundred factions towards one system. The lair of the monsters awoken by the Shrek. We knew Terra had but one system. The history of their first contact war oozed through, no matter how Terra tightened the blockades on their voice space. Shrike fugitives discovered and rushed into hiding, questioned until every possible bit of knowledge was extracted from their willing minds. Bounty hunters and privately contracted mercs spilling the data their sensor arrays drank during furtive flybys of the radiation burn strike homeworlds. Vagrants and scavengers that claim to have spoken with a Terran face to face. Illicit dealers all too happy to accept bribes in exchange for both strike and Terran movements. The Confederation began to suspect and poured all their hope on their suspicion. It proved true. Terra would not fight battleship line to battleship line, jump after jump, stinging like insects around a herd animal but they would not engage in battle. The jumps were a smokescreen, used with enough frequency to cement the ruse. Terra possessed the power of the omnipresent gods, but confined to a mere handful of ships from a tiny system way out on the edge of the black. A civilization scarcely a generation past their first contact war. Their numbers were too few. So the tight, staggered combat boxes were wrestled tighter still, and the drive engine sea with azure light as the armadas pushed for soul free. The Terran Dreadnoughts fell into reality on the outskirts of Sol's void space, inscrutable as the duracell of their armour, motionless aside from the shimmer of stabilisation thrusters. The UCN decelerated hard under the battleless stare of the mass drivers, the gun houses manifesting from hyperspace at ranges that conceded little reaction time to the Uranium payloads. The sirens keened their cry of targeting lasers, painting the hulls with invisible rays. The two fleets hung within the void, impassive as dying stars. 
Perhaps that moment was the last chance. What might have been, however, will only drive mad those who obsess over it. Did the klaxons that warned of incoming fire sound first with terror or the confederation? Did the mass driver cycle before or after the energy blasts cross that expanse of void in a blink, flaring the dreadnought shields into the visible spectrum? Were the torpedoes away first? Or did the evasion computers attempt to spin the battleships aside from incoming projectiles, the anti-grav fighting to maintain interior orientation? When the glitter of energy blasts had faded into the void and the vented ammo was dragged into the nearest gravity well, the UCM formations were re-established, headings calculated, and the armadas advanced again upon terror. The dreadnoughts were drifting husks, their hulls sold at a horrific price, but sold just the same. The next jump was into the core. Almost into the atmosphere above monolithic residential megablocks, it was a carrier with a cargo of heavy bombers, each with a belly full of incendiary explosives, napalm on a high oxy planet. The Confederation knew what this was. A warning. Do not fuck with us of the highest degree. Besides, the more astute were reading between the lines, realising that the Shrike were not as innocent in their part of the First Contact War, as at first it may seem. But the world had just watched its children burn. They wanted needed retribution. Worlds were reconstructed into fortresses, built to withstand the siege as the UCN accelerated for terror. The defences had but to hold for a little while, until the combined might of the United Galaxies reached the homeworld of these monsters from the edge of the black. It was now that the broadside lines were brought to bear, Terran dreadnoughts and UCN battleships. The battles were decided not with flesh and bone, but endured behind the masks of Duracell and Synthaglass. Iron shielded hulls and the targeting computers linked into plasma cannon batteries, gun crews, and torpedo autoloaders. These were the behemoths and leviathans of the void, whose roars were the splintering of alloy and breath, the atmo fuel fires. The Terran ships increased their jump frequency, point blank jumps to maneuver within CQC operations, D space jumps to infiltrate far into homeward void space. The jumps were coordinated too, across the vast battlefields of the void. Coordinated to isolate and destroy ships forced out of their formations. Coordinated to confuse, misdirect, intimidate. To provide bomber escort, to deploy fighter squadrons, cruiser overwatch, and to evoke maximised destruction in every moment of conflict. The same Terran ship, designated Fallen Angel, was seen in three separate theatres within the time of a single standard day, its mass driver cycling as fast as the gun crews could feed the gaping breach. Every kilometre of the Sol system was paid for with Confederation blood and every kilometre closer to Terra meant another jump through the light years to home. Manufacturing plants obliterated with general purpose demolition bombs. Orbital mining rigs raised by torpedo detonations. Supply convoys left drifting after mass driver broadsides. Admo siphoned out of boarded closed orbit stations and replaced with sarin gas. Steel mills crumpled under orbital bombardment. Docking stations hit with long range artillery strikes. Munition depots strafed with fighter wings. Contagion bombs detonated over the urban farming centres, starving millions. The second law of terror military doctrine. There are no civilians during war. Perhaps we learn this too late. Flushed warheads fired through the unarmoured hull of a medical frigate, returning with wounded to the core homeworlds. The UCN slogged towards terror, and the jump slowed. A dreadnought was discovered, drifting, undamaged, shields still stable. After boarding, the crew was found dead, their physical bodies in perfect health. Three-dimensional forms are not meant to see the layers of hyperspace, not meant to travel the stars unshielded by relay stations on the FDR lanes. The jumps slowed as the crews were slowly spent. Sol 4 was a red planet, dead for long eons, resurrected by the Terran war machine as a manufacturing base for his ships. The battle of the Martian drive yards will live in infamy for the rest of the time. The better part of the fleet was spent against the orbital defences, fire and steel and blood beyond reckoning. The UCM Marines still hold their place as the second largest ground assault in history, to this very time. Terran shock troopers, enhanced with stolen Shrike hardware and synthesized Terran wetware, fought with a fanaticism there too unbelievable. Their forms were small, lacking natural weapons, yes, but their technology transformed them into a combat species as adapted as any evolved for it. And they had pets, beasts, genetically engineered carnivores awoken from dormant genetic codes. Creatures that were loyal to their masters, strong and fast, wherever Terran was weak or slow. Blood. Steel. Energy bolts and the acrid smell of kinetic rifles. Screaming. The screaming. When the Battle of the Martian Drive Yards was finished, the battle lines in the Martian sand had moved scarce centimetres. But the piles of corpses, ship and creature littered the surface, contesting in count the very number of grains upon the world. And the Confederation knew that Terra was spent. 
The Dreadnought crews held their sanity by threats. The Terran ships were scorched and bented, their soldiers wounded and tired. The Confederation knew. They were spent, not now, not soon. But the war had been won that battle. The might of the United Galaxies against a lone system. The after-action reports flooded in. They were dissected, categorized, filed, analyzed. The Confederation redeployed its crippled armadas and regrouped battered air wings. The strategists scrutinized enemy movements. They discovered a third facet of terror military doctrine, one they did not at first admit they knew. It was a doctrine that conflicted itself, a paradox. It stated that a Terran soldier is to be considered during all aspects of strategy worth incalculably more than any enemy combatant. It stated that a single Terran soldier is to be better trained, better equipped, and better supported than any enemy. Every Terran soldier was to have a purpose, and would specialize in that purpose. Pilot, gunner, sniper, bombardier. The purpose was drilled into Terran soldier until it was a religion. A religion followed with fanatical fervor. A religion that ensured every Terran soldier was elite in their function. It also stated that a Terran life is meaningless before the safety of the homeworld. It stated that every Terran had already died in their first contact war, and to live now as a gift, given temporarily, so that soul free would be protected. But Terra was finished now. A single slip in UCN's strategy could see the destruction of this armada, but the next armada will be larger, built and financed and crewed by the parents of staff children and children of five on parents. The Confederation was fueled with righteous anger at the atrocities visited upon its homeworlds by the monsters from the Edge of the Black, released before they had consumed themselves in the darkness, far from the FDR lanes. Terrans were animals. Nothing but animals. And they would be driven to extinction like so many others. Then the orders came to return. Emergency codes. Hard burn for the core. The UCN is needed urgently. Thoughts turned to another attack. A final jump into the core. Something even more horrific than the sick minds of Terran engineers. But after the long time to the nearest FTL lane, then the slingshot of relay stations of the homeworlds, it was revealed to be something none had conceived. Every species has a first contact war. So does every universe. They were creatures of more than these three dimensions. Impossible to distinguish their ship or flesh or natural phenomena. They were inevitable, as the more of a black hole, devouring world after world. An example science that slid like a creeping fog over the stars, smothering them into darkness until the night sky was black. They could not be reasoned with. They could not be fled from. They could not be fought. The universe was being swallowed by its first contact war. The Confederation selected their bearer, their emissary with a single charge. They send their fastest ship accelerating a max burn away from the core. The envoy was to awaken the monsters on the edge of the black. Jump.